Okay, class, greetings once again from Kuwait. I will be back tomorrow to hold a review session. Watch for an announcement about the time on that. And then Friday is our midterm three. Um, so the last amount of uh, stuff that we want to cover is chapter 17, which is on thermal properties. So here's our learning objectives. We're going to figure out what is heat capacity and how we can use it to figure out how much heat goes into a material in order to change the temperature of that material. Right? We're going to relate that to something called the Dulong Petit Limit and the Debye Temperature. Then we're going to move and we're going to go back to thermal expansion, which we've already talked about this semester. We're going to review the things we've learned and talk about a few additional things. Um, and then we're going to get into the heart of this chapter, which is using Fick's first and second law right, for steady state and non-steady state transport. But instead of transport of mass, which was diffusion, our last chapter, we're going to do it for thermal transport. And it's amazing that these actually the exact same equations govern both both types of transport, which is pretty rad. So we'll, we'll give you some examples there. And we'll talk about, generally speaking, what is thermal conductivity? How do you calculate it? Um, what's the temperature dependence of it? Uh, what are some typical values? What are different things that make it be higher or lower, that make, don't make it be higher or lower? And then we'll talk about thermal stress and shock. Okay, so let's dive right into it. Um, so lots and lots of things happen as, as a material gets heated up, right? You've got thermal expansion, which we've talked about. We know that crystallization, recovery, recrystallization, dislocation motion, diffusion motion, all these things happen, right, as you heat a material up. So it's important to understand how materials heat up, right? Um, and one of the most important things to dictate that is the heat capacity, right? By definition, heat capacity is defined as the amount of energy absorbed in a material to produce a unit rise in temperature, or mathematically, C, our heat capacity, is equal to dq over dt, where q is heat and t is our temperature, right? So what's the dq in order to get some change in temperature? Um, now, sometimes it's called specific heat instead of heat capacity, right? And all that means is that you've taken uh, this energy, right, and you've divided it by the amount of substance. So instead of just being uh, energy, which is joules per degree Kelvin, we say per amount of substance. So that might be per mole of substance or maybe per kilogram, but that's specific heat. So it's still talking about heat capacity, but now we're actually talking about really how much material is heating up. Now you can measure this under two different conditions. You can do it under CP, that's constant pressure, or CV, where it's constant volume. Um, so we're not going to do clicker questions because I'm not there, but think to yourself, should CP be greater than, equal to, or less than CV? Should there be a difference if you measure it under constant pressure, volume? Um, as you're thinking about that, the thing to keep in mind is if it's under constant volume, then it can't expand, right? If it can't expand, then it can't do work on its surroundings. Therefore, if it can't do work on its surroundings, um, but CP can, then we know that CP can actually absorb more energy. That CP should be greater than CV because... We know that PV equals nRT, right? And that work is equal to PdV. So normally, if you heat something up, the volume also increases. If the volume increases, if this change in volume, then you're doing work on your surroundings. And therefore, CP is slightly greater than CV, okay? All right, so energy is going into your material. Some of that energy might be doing work on the surroundings, if it's the case of CP. What about the other stuff, right? Well, the other stuff can go in a couple different places. The energy can go to electronic transitions. That might mean that the electrons that are zooming around in your material get a boost, that their kinetic energy goes up, right? That could mean that they get promoted to higher energy levels, right? Um, then you've also got things like magnetic transitions, right? The spins in your material, which again, we're gonna talk about magnetic materials a little bit later on in chapter 12, but the spins, they can go from being ordered um, to a random, right? But to do so, th these things can absorb energy, right? This is why magnets, um, if you think way back to our iron wire demo, that had the magnet that was sticking to the iron, the magnetic moments were ordered in that material. That's why it stuck to the wire. But when we heat it up enough, those magnetic moments, instead of being perfectly aligned in one direction, they all of a sudden were pointing every which way, and it lost its magnetism, and it fell off the wire. But it took energy to, to go from that ordered to random arrangement. Um, by far the biggest contrib contribution of where this energy goes is goes to vibrating, right? Vibrating your atoms. These atoms start to vibrate in their position. So instead of like, we've been talking about these crystal structures, the atoms are at these specific spots, but they're not like static. As you're heating up anywhere above zero K, they start to vibrate, right? And the amplitude of that vibration gets bigger and bigger as you heat it up higher and higher, right? But that's the vibration, right? So amplitude increases with temperature, uh, and these vibrations 
we call them phonons, right? They are coupled with the lattice, right? And there's two types of, of, of phonon vibrations. We can have longitudinal and transverse, right? Here's an example. If you look at this one, this is not a nice square lattice. This lattice, is, this lattice has been broken up. Rather than atoms uh, located in a nice square that just continues all the way through your material, if you notice in that drawing, the lattice has now been compressed in regions, right? So we see like the C here, right? So that's compression, and then you've got refraction over here, where it's now been, it's sort of stretched apart. And if you look at like the distance between these events, right, it's pretty much constant. It has a wavelength. So you can think of these waves of compression where these atoms are sort of pushed towards one another, right? But overall, the, the wave would probably travel that way or, or you know this way. But the displacement is in the same direction as the wave. We call this a longitudinal wave. Longitudinal. We also call this a sound wave, right? Right, right? So if you remember last class when we talked about, um, or a couple classes ago, when we talked about the uh, railroad track, right? Somebody hits it with a, with a hammer really far away, you can hear it. Because these transmit really efficiently through the material. As they travel through the material, these uh, waves travel well because the displacement is in the same direction as the wave travels. But there's another type of phonon, right? Instead of that, um, imagine you're watching a football game and somebody does the wave, right? In the wave, that travels, like say the whole wave travels this way across the stadium. But the way that it travels is by people taking their arms and raising them up, right? So their motion of the atoms would be transverse to the direction of the wave, right? It goes the opposite direction, or not the opposite direction, it goes 90 degrees, it's orthogonal to it, right? So that's uh, what we call a transverse phonon, or sometimes we call this an optical phonon. As opposed to a sound wave, it's an optical phonon, right? Okay, so that's longitudinal versus transverse. Um, you can see these things, like there's some really cool YouTube videos, like this one. It's the, it's almost cliched, right? You got some Northern Europeans in like a, a wooden home listening to house music, right? As you do when you're a Northern European. And as they're listening to house music, they've got it plumbed to a <clears throat> chamber that has methane or propane or something going through it and they've lit it on fire. So you probably saw a one-dimensional version of this in high school somewhere at some point. It's called a Rubens tube. And when you have standing waves in this thing, what happens is these standing in waves... Gas and light it on fire. So you basically... Right here, right? You pump in this flammable gas and light it on fire and a standing wave will make regions of low pressure and high pressure. So when they do this, you'll see sort of like rise and fall in the flame because some places has lots of gas rushing through and other places because low pressure doesn't have gas rushing through. Right, you can see that it's doing this sort of wave business. So in this uh, video, they basically do the same thing, but they do it in two dimensions and they start playing music through it. And instead of seeing a single spot where it happens, you can see it happening uh, like whole regions lighting up with patterns which is pretty neat. So I mean, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that, but check it out if you want. Look up two-dimensional Rubens tube. All right, so <clears throat> a transverse wave, as opposed to a longitudinal one, that has the displacement of the atoms, because they're literally going to be moving, but that's going to be perpendicular to the propagation of the wave, right? So for example, if the wave is propagating this way, you see that these atoms, they're moving up and down, not side to side, okay? Something that is interesting is that when it comes to phonons, which are displaced atoms, they're waves of displaced atoms, there's a fundamental, fundamental limit to how small you can get. You can't just have like an arbitrarily small wavelength because the wavelength is made up of atoms themselves. So how are you going to have a wave with a wavelength that's smaller than the inner atomic distance? You can't, right? The smallest wavelength you can get would be right here. You see this one? with three atoms. You've got crest, trough, and crest, right? I'm going the wrong way. Crest, trough, crest, right? That's the smallest you can get. So because atoms have a minimum sort of bonding distance between them, and it's going to depend on what material you have, how big that distance is, that puts a lower limit on how big these waves can be, which is important, okay? Um, but they can be very, very large. So we're not just talking about one wavelength. There's typically lots and lots of wavelengths, depending on what your end value is right here. You can go through lots of different ranges, okay? Because of that, it's important to talk about frequencies or wavelengths of phonons, and to do so with the idea of a phonon distribution. Let me 
code. A phonon distribution rather than a single phonon. It's not like all the phonons in the material are all at the same wavelength of vibration. You typically have lots and lots. There's like a range. You've got some on the low end, some on the high end, and everywhere in between. Okay. Um, with each phonon, the energy is quantized, right? Quantized. That means that it goes in discrete energy levels, and that has to do with the wavelength of the phonon. Okay. Um, this is analogous to, by the way, the energy quantized in a photon. Each photon has a certain amount of energy that's proportional to its um, wavelength. Similar things in phonons, okay? Um, what's important is that these phonon waves, as they travel through material, they can do two things. They can transport heat, right? Um, think of the longitudinal wave up here. If you were trying to transmit energy across the room and you had a bunch of people standing up, if I shove somebody, right, then I might create a wave like this. As they fall forward, they crash into other people, and then you get these like refraction compression regions. That's going to transmit energy efficiently. Meanwhile, if there's that same group of people and I raise my hands, because I'm not pushing that wave in front of me, even though a wave might start, it's not as likely to transmit energy. So sound waves or longitudinal phonons are much, much more efficient at transmitting heat than optical phonons. Okay? There's a difference in their ability, but they can both transport heat. Just some do it better than others. Um, that's why we said right here, longitudinal or acoustic sound waves are much more effective at transmitting heat than optical ones. But they can also scatter electrons, right? So if you have electrons zooming through your material, let's say because it's a metal like copper and you want high conductivity, well, if you start messing with the lattice and it's vibrating, the conductivity of your metal goes down. So this is like one of the classic uh, things. If we pull up um, conductivity of metal versus temperature, um, this is the definition of a metal, is that when you heat it up, the resistivity of that metal goes up. We haven't talked about these things yet, but it's just the ability for that material to conduct electricity is affected by temperature, right? So take this, right? Our resistivity, this is the resistance to electrons, it goes up in metals, right? And that's because as you heat this thing up, there's more and more phonons vibrating, their amplitude is larger, they're scattering electrons, okay? So that's that. Um, let's talk about the temperature dependence of heat capacity, though, for a minute. Heat capacity, if, at your, if you're at zero Kelvin, there should be no atomic motion. Therefore, you have no heat capacity because the vast majority of energy gets stored in these atomic vibrations, so it should go to zero. And then as you heat it up at very low temperatures, it has this T cubed dependence where A is a constant. So the, the heat capacity increases. And you can see that on these plots. See this region down here, that sort of curved region? That's your T cubed region at really low temperatures. And for the vast majority of temperatures, it just sort of rises and then it reaches a plateau, right? But you'll notice that these different materials, lead, silver, aluminum, diamond, they all rise, but they rise at sort of different rates. Lead reaches the plateau really low temperatures at 100 Kelvin. Silver reaches its plateau 225, aluminum 428, diamond 2000. So what's going on? If you take all those materials and divide the temperature by what's called their Debye temperature, then all of their heat capacity lies on the same line, right? This is because heat capacity obeys something called the Dulong Petit limit, right? That's equal to 3R. Heat capacity, CV, approaches 3 times the gas constant, at high temperatures. There's things that break this rule, right? But it generally holds for many materials. As you heat them up at high enough temperatures, they reach 3R as temperature approaches the divide temperature, right? <clears throat> so you can figure out what the heat capacity is. So question is for you guys is above the divide temperature, does that mean that the material is still absorbing energy to raise temperature? What we're really saying is that the heat capacity is reaching a constant value, a constant value. Um, so if you're above the Debye temperature, the question is, is it still absorbing energy to get hotter? And the answer is yes, it is still absorbing energy, but it's absorbing at a constant rate. It's not changing. Whereas below that temperature, um, it was progressively getting harder and harder and harder to heat your material up because the heat capacity kept rising. But once it plateaus, it doesn't get harder to heat it up. It stays at the same rate. The same amount of energy is required to get the same per degree increase in temperature, right? So that's Debye limit. That's the, uh, uh, Dulong petit limit or the divide temperature limit. Okay. All right. Let's go back to thermal expansion. We've talked about this already over the course of the semester. You've seen expressions like this where the change in length, LF minus L naught divided by L naught, um, that is equal to the thermal expansion coefficient alpha sub L multiplied by the difference in temperature, TF minus T naught, right? So 
since LF minus L0 divided by L0 is just strain, then this is a really great way to figure out how much strain occurs for a given temperature difference. If you know the thermal expansion coefficient, you can calculate that strain, right? Um, so that was for linear thermal expansion. We can also do volumetric thermal expansion, right? Where now it's the final volume minus the initial volume divided by initial volume. Um, same thing, same temperature over here, except now we have alpha V. That's going to be our volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion, right? So that's not the linear coefficient of thermal expansion anymore. Um, if your material is um, anisotropic, let's say you have like a crystal like this with like graphite, right? Where you've got planes of carbon atoms in your, in your graphite material, okay? These materials, as you heat it up, you're going to get very different expansion in this plane than transverse to that plane. That's an anisotropic crystal. If you take something that's isotropic like silicon or diamond, which is much more isotropic, then it's going to be the same amount of expansion in all the different directions, right? For isotropic materials, then we can approximate the volumetric coefficient of thermal expansion as simply three times the linear value, okay? We remember that thermal expansion comes from this energy potential well diagram where the energy of, you know, associated with the bonding of, of different atoms against distance, um, that it, the average value sort of increases and that's what causes thermal expansion. And if it's a weakly bound material, meaning that the depth of this well is not very deep compared to the one that's very deep, that this one tends to be more symmetric and therefore less thermal expansion. This one tends to be less symmetric and therefore more thermal expansion. An important thing to note is that when people report this uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, whether it's linear or volumetric, there's two ways that you can really report it. So you've got to be a little bit careful. They might be reporting the following. So here they're, they're showing strain, right, delta L over L, against temperature, right? So from here up to here represents your delta T, right? So it makes sense that the slope should be the, if you remember our equation, delta L over L equaled alpha, our coefficient of thermal expansion, times delta T. So it should just be the slope. But the problem is you can evaluate that a couple different ways. You can say, well, it's the average. When you start it at some temperature, when you heat it up to there, the average thermal expansion is this green line. Or they might be reporting the instantaneous value, where now they're saying at this point in time, the cotangent, right, the instantaneous value is there. And they're going to be very different values, right? So be aware if they're reporting the average thermal expansion or the instantaneous thermal expansion because they're different things, okay? So what are some typical values? We've said this before, but I'll just be briefly reiterate. For metals, they expand um, sort of a, a medium amount, something like 5 to 25 ppm per K. And remember that ppm just means that you take that number divided by a million parts per million. Um, now, some metals break this rule. Take Kovar. Kovar is an alloy that's really interesting. It's an iron nickel cobalt alloy, and it's designed specifically have really low thermal conductivity. Most metals would be significantly higher than this, but it only has a thermal expansion of 1 ppm per K. The reason they do that is because in lots and lots of devices, we need to join a metal with a ceramic. And if you join those two, and if it undergoes heating changes, then the metal expands more than the ceramic, which will fracture your ceramic, right? So, the, so they specifically de designed this alloy called Kovar to have a CTE, a coefficient of thermal expansion, that basically matches borosilicate glass, which lets us use these things bonded together, even if the temperature is changing, without generating as much thermal stress, which we'll show you in a minute. Okay, ceramics, because they have a stronger bonding and a deeper potential well, that means that they're more symmetric and less thermal expansion. So their values, instead of being 5 to 25 or something like less than 1 to 15, typically, right? Um, these can be isotropic for non-crystalline materials, like glass tends to expand in all directions the same way, whereas other ceramics might, like the graphite that I showed you before, will be very uh, anisotropic, okay? Things like fused silica are important to be aware of. It can have basically zero thermal expansion. If we look at it, it's pretty crazy. Let's pull up thermal expansion silica. It's basically zero. It's wild. So, oh, where's a good plot? Uh, these aren't really what I'm looking for. These are really low values. So those are low thermal expansion materials. These are all low thermal expansion materials. But quartz uh, is super, super low. It's basically zero. When you compare that to a metal, I'm trying to find a plot that has metals and other things sort of shown with it. But the thermal expansion of, of it is very, very low. I mean, let's take, take a look at this one, right? 
So here they're showing borosilicate glass versus some of these other glasses, and they can have actually negative thermal expansion, meaning, strangely, they, they shrink a little bit upon heating, right, which seems counterintuitive. Um, if you take a ceramics class here at the University of Utah, they'll, they'll talk about why this happens a little bit. But at going from 0K up to 300K, it's basically zero. And then 300K is right around room temperature. Over this range, some of these materials can have almost no thermal expansion, whereas other things might have lots of thermal expansion. Okay? So that's quartz or fused silica. Um, now polymers, because they're weakly bonded, you've got van der Waals bonding, holding the chains together. Uh, you have a shallow potential well, very asymmetric. You can have really big thermal expansion, so 50 to 400 ppm per K. I actually did a project uh, with a company here in the valley where they were putting, they had big tankers, and they would put polymer liners on them to protect the tanker. So if you're shipping acid across the country and you have hydrochloric acid, and a steel tanker, <clears throat> that acid will eat the metal. So what they do is they would put down a polymer liner. You have the vessel. They'd put the polymer liner on the inside of that to protect it. But what happened is that as the temperature would fluctuate, day to night cycles, drive to Montana, drive back down to Texas, these temperature uh, fluctuations were causing a problem because the polymer wanted to expand and contract a lot, and the metal underneath it didn't want to very much. And then you've got the epoxy layer in between and these little thin ceramic fibers that were sort of also in between these layers. And so you basically saw big thermal mismatches that caused a big thermal stress, which we'll be talking about in a minute, um, and caused, was causing them to break. So we helped them fix that problem. Um, okay, let's talk about thermal conductivity for a minute. If you think back to the last chapter, which had diffusion, we said that the, the flux of mass, which is the amount of mass per unit area per unit time, was equal to negative d, or diffusion coefficient, times dc dx, the gradient in concentration. Uh, what's amazing is that this, which we call the fixed first law, the exact same equation holds for thermal transport. They call it Fourier's law. Um, Fourier's law, after a famous scientist, Fourier. Um, but we do have to modify it. Now the flux of heat, which is again the amount of heat, Q, per area per time, right? We could just as easily write J here, but the amount of heat per area per time. Instead of using the diffusion coefficient, which had to do with the motion of atoms, that's not what we want. We need a new coefficient, which is the ability of a material to conduct heat, since this is heat traveling through it. And the other difference is instead of a gradient concentration, it's not a gradient concentration driving heat flow. It's a difference in temperature. So it's dt dx, but otherwise these are the exact same, right? These work the exact same way, okay? Um, if you do the unit analysis, you'll find that the units of kappa are thermal conductivity. It needs to have the units of watts per meter kelvin in order to get the right units on the left-hand side, which is going to be joules per area per time. And this is dt dx, so that's difference in temperature divided by difference in distance. This has to have the units of watts, which is a joule per second per meter kelvin, okay? Now, um, <clears throat> where does thermal conductivity come from? Thermal conductivity can be calculated if you know the density, the thermal diffusivity, and the heat capacity, right? Thermal diffusivity, this is a lot like the diffusion coefficient from before. It has the units of the same diffusion coefficient, meter squared per second. That's just like the diffusion coefficient. Um, and interestingly, this, this thermal diffusivity alpha, it gets used in fixed second law for heat. Remember fixed second law for mass, we said that we could figure out the concentration at any position x at any time t. All we needed was the diffusion coefficient. Well, we can do the same thing in temperature. We can figure out the temperature at any position, assuming a semi-infinite solution, just like we did with uh, diffusion. But the only difference is that we use thermal diffusivity here instead of conductivity. So this is important to note. Do not use kappa here, use alpha, the thermal diffusivity. So you do not use thermal conductivity here, you use thermal diffusivity. That is the only difference between these two. In diffusion, we used mass transport, we used the same D diffusion coefficient for both fixed first law and for fixed second law. But for thermal transport, the only difference is that you use thermal conductivity for fixed first law and you use thermal diffusivity for the second law. Okay, that's the only difference. And this is the relationship between thermal conductivity, thermal diffusivity. It's related via the density and the heat capacity. Okay? Um, so how is heat moved through a material? There's different ways that we can move heat through a material. It can come from lots of sources. The phonons are the ones we've been talking about, but electrons 
they carry heat, right? As in fact, the more conductive a metal is, the more heat it will also conduct. This is known as the Wiedemann Franz law. The Wiedemann Franz law is famous. It basically said that there's a constant L, what they call the Lorentz number, and if you take the thermal conductivity, you divide it by the electrical conductivity at times temperature, that this is always going to be a constant, right? And it's it's not actually always a constant for materials. It varies a little bit, but it usually varies like plus or minus 50% or like a factor of two, which is pretty incredible. So all that's really saying is that electrons carry heat in addition to their charge, right? Which makes sense. They, they have energy associated with them, so they're taking energy with them as they move. But you can also have radiative heat transfer. We've got people in the mechanical engineering department that do awesome work on that. Um, Basically, if you've ever stood next to a fire, you felt radiative heat transfer. The heat of that is literally phonon, photons, excuse me. It's electromagnetic radiation coming off of that that's hitting you and you feel that. Um, that's radiative heat. You can have convection. That's like a blow dryer where it's blowing hot air, right? And you're feeling the heat transfer due to convection, which is <clears throat> motion of those of atoms or molecules, right? In either fluid gas or solid form. Um, so, And there's probably other things we could think of, but like these are the ways that heat gets transported, okay? Um, and things will influence uh, the ability for heat to get transported. For example, what you're seeing here on the y-axis is thermal conductivity, so you've got kappa. And on the x-axis, you're seeing composition tin as it goes from pure tin to what? Copper. So this is like pure copper over here, pure tin. Copper is a very good conductor of heat. 400 watts per meter Kelvin. That's why they use copper as copper heat sinks, right? In computers and electronics. Uh, if you need to get that heat out of there and you put a piece of copper on it, it can transmit it very quickly, right? Meanwhile, pure tin, not so good. Uh, it's still pretty good, 80 watts per meter Kelvin or so. That's pretty darn good. But in the middle, it gets a little bit lower, right? So when you have a mixture of two different elements, the impurities can scatter phonons, right? So the phonons are these waves of atomic motion and they can get scattered by impurities, okay? Um, ceramics, right? Uh, thermal conductivity tends to be small because you don't have free electrons in ceramics. Oftentimes, they, they're not like metals where you have lots of free electrons. The electrons are tied up in what are called covalent bonds, right? Instead of metallic bonds where they're sort of loosely allowed to, ro allowed to roam. In covalent bonds, they're directional bonds and the electrons can't escape. And so these things don't conduct heat as well usually, but there's exceptions like diamond. Diamond is like the best thermal conductor I think that we know of, and it has like, you know, several thousand watts per meter Kelvin thermal conductivity, even without free electrons. And the reason why is because phonons can travel so well in diamond, right? And so there's this interesting concept. If you want to change the ability to, for a material to conduct heat, you want to make it more disordered. That's going to disallow phonon transport, right? And so amorphous materials like glass, where there's no crystal structure, they're not going to be able to transmit phonons very well because it's all just random. The atoms aren't in nice, discrete positions, so they tend to have really low thermal conductivity. Glass, the reason that we put glass on our windows in our home is for two things. First off, it's transparent, which is nice, but it's also pretty low thermal conductivity, which is nice. Uh, we can make it better. And that's why we do double pane glass and things like that. Um, but it already is pretty low because it's an amorphous or non-crystalline material. Okay, when you plot thermal conductivity for materials, they typically follow the following trend. You see this rise at first and then this like gradual fall. What's going on there? <clears throat> well, this is plotting thermal conductivity against temperature. As you heat it up, you start to see more and more phonons arise, right? If you're adding energy, you're basically allowing the atoms to move around more and these vibrations are phonons, right? And if you get too many of them, they start to bounce off of one another. So this is phonon scattering. Phonons scatter off of one another. And so it slowly lowers the thermal conductivity of the material, right? So at low temperature, you don't have many phonons because these are thermally activated. The, more, the higher the temperature, the more phonons you have. So think of it like um, <clears throat> people moving through a subway. Early in the morning, there's no people in there. So the very first people that show up, the thing that would scatter them is like bouncing off of pillars, garbage cans, homeless people, right? But then as you heat it up, that's, that's akin to adding more people to the subway station. Now there's more and more people are going to start to bounce off of each other, and that's going to limit the ability for overall heat to transmit through the material. So that's phonon versus impurity, things like garbage cans, versus phonon, phonon, where they bounce off of each other, right? So higher and higher temperature, you get more and more phonon, phonon scattering, and that lowers the, the thermal conductivity. Um, porosity can have a huge inf influence on reducing thermal conductivity right here. 
That's why things like foams, polymer foams, they intentionally are designed, see they'll sort of spray them here. And as they're spraying them, there's a foaming agent that causes a little cavity to form, lots and lots and lots of little cavities. And each one of those is filled with air, which doesn't conduct heat very well compared to the solid. So having a very porous foam can really reduce your thermal conductivity, right? You can get foams down to like 0.3 watts per meter Kelvin. You can form aerogels. Um, if you haven't heard of an aerogel before, it's pretty cool. An aerogel is pure silica mixed with air, right? So silica is the same stuff that your glass is made of, like your glass windows, right? But they, instead of taking pure dense glass, they add a ton, ton, ton of porosity, right? And these things have bonkers thermal conductivity, just crazy low thermal conductivity because it's so much air. And I, I can't remember the number, but these are something like one weight percent solid. It's the vast majority of tiny little air pockets with thin cell membranes of the silica, okay? So you can get very low thermal conductivity. Um, I missed this, that radiative transport doesn't play a big impact until you get to high temperatures. <clears throat> Maybe you've noticed this, that um, when you stand next to the stove, it doesn't look like it's hot, but you touch it, and it's actually quite hot when you touch it. But once it's glowing red, you can like feel it, right? So it has what's called a T to the fourth dependency, dependence, right? So it, it's proportional to T to the fourth power. So the hotter and the hotter you get, it really starts to take off. Radiation can then like dominate the heat transport. So like the sun, the reason that we heal, feel heat from the sun is radiative transport, right? Because it's so hot that it's spitting out a ton of energy. And there's, uh, there's an equation that describes that called the Stefan Boltzmann equation, but beyond the scope of this class. Okay, let's go back to thermal stresses. The strain that comes, the strain that comes from thermal expansion, right? This is strain right here. That was due to thermal expansion coefficient times the difference in temperature. And we know that stress is equal to strain times the Young's modulus. So to figure out thermal stress, all we need to do is add Young's modulus to this equation, right? Add Young's modulus to the strain already coming from it, and we get thermal expansion, or sorry, we get thermal stresses. So this full expression now with the Young's modulus, that's our thermal stress, right? Now we're gonna define a stress just like before, if it's less than zero, that's compressive. If it's greater than zero, that's tension. And there's some great problems where we work out what those values might be. Uh, let's say you've got two materials, actually, and they're both expanding, right? They're both expanding. That means that what you really care about is the difference in the thermal expansion, right? So, um, so it's not really alpha. It's not alpha L. It's the difference in alpha L, right, between two materials. Or in other words, it's alpha 1 L minus alpha 2 L for material 1 and 2. Okay, for material 1 and 2, it's the difference between them that will give you your thermal stress. It doesn't matter if you have two high thermal expansion materials, right? <clears throat> two materials that expand a lot and you put them together doesn't mean you're gonna have a high thermal stress. But if you put a material that has a high thermal expansion and a low thermal expansion together, that's gonna create stresses, okay? In fact, it's gonna create complementary stresses. That's what I mean by that. I mean, if you take, let's take, so we've got this material, we make a bimetallic strip. By the way, this is how most like old uh, thermostats worked. I think some actually still work like this. We've got material A up here, and you've got material B down here. And then you heat it up. And let's say that the thermal expansion of material A is less than the thermal expansion of material B. That means when you heat this thing up, if it's still bonded together, right, undergo delta T, it will now be a little bit longer, but what has happened? Material A wanted to expand less than material B. So material A, since it wanted to expand less than B, material A is under tension, and material B is under compression, right? Material A is holding B back from what it would like to be. Material A is being dragged along further than it would like to be. So you're gonna get tension and compression. So if these are both, say, ceramic materials, where they're both strong under compression but weak under tension, material A is more likely to break. And it's gonna depend on its strength, right? But it's the one under tension, okay? Um, all right, let's talk about thermal shock for a minute. Thermal shock is when you rapidly change the temperature of a material. Specifically, when you change the temperature of one spot relative to the rest of your material. So if I have a dinner plate, <clears throat> maybe you've done this before, 
maybe you had a dinner plate and you set something really hot on it, right? And then it also broke, right? Maybe you took like a hot mug, a hot glass or something, or a hot pan and set it just on part of a piece of ceramic and it fractured. What's happening is that locally, you're causing it to expand in one spot, but the rest of it that's not being heated up is not expanding, right? So again, let's draw, let's draw a picture. Let's say we've got a plate and I put a hot beaker on it right here, right? So now that spot is hot. So because that spot is hot, it wants to expand, right? This thing would like to expand to a larger volume, but it's constrained by the rest of the plate and that's gonna produce lots and lots of strain, right? And if your material is a metal, then it can maybe accommodate that strain. But if it's a ceramic, it can't accommodate any strain, right? Remember our, our ceramic curve when we do uh, stress versus strain, they're basically straight up like that and they fracture. They can accommodate very little strain. And so if you heat up just one spot of a ceramic, it'll break. Even though the whole ceramic might melt at a really high temperature and you think, oh great, it's really thermally stable, that doesn't mean that it has high thermal shock resistance because this is all about fracture. Fracture is about right strain right and if you've got a big mismatch in strain that's going to cause a, a huge uh it's going to fracture right because it can't accommodate that so if you want to have a material that is thermal shock resistant then here's what you want you obviously want a high failure strength sigma f the stronger the material obviously the better the thermal shock resistance but you also want a high thermal conductivity you want a low modulus and you want a low thermal expansion why so let's think about these three things. First off, high thermal conductivity. That means if this spot over here is T hot and the rest of it is at T cold, a high thermal conductivity material means that this thing's going to even out very quickly. That means that this thing's expanding, but this stuff is also expanding. And so the stress which will be generated, the strain difference is low. Therefore, low stress, less likely to break. So high thermal conductivity is good. Um, <clears throat> what about modulus? Well, modulus basically says for a given stress, how much strain you achieve. So a low modulus material won't generate as much strain and therefore won't generate as much stress. Make sense? Thermal expansion, same thing. If you have a low coefficient of thermal expansion, even though this pot is hotter, it's not gonna expand that much and therefore there won't be as much strain and so that should also drive, uh, if you have a low thermal coefficient, that should lead to a better thermal shock resistance. And you can use this thermal shock to do cool things, right? You can cut glass bottles. So in this video, you're going to see a guy <clears throat> take glass bottles and he's going to score it. Hi guys. In this video, I'll show you an easy he's, he scores it and then he puts it in between cold and hot water back and forth and it actually causes this thing to fracture, which is pretty neat. So as he takes it from one side to the other, it will eventually fracture. Clean. Right? So here he is. He's Another thing is you can actually take a, a flame torch and you can cut these things by flame. So I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this. Um, and you can see these alumina tubes get broken in a similar fashion. <clears throat> if you take regular alumina and you heat it up to boiling, you know, super white hot heat and then put it into water, it's going to fracture. So you can see that here. Here they've got something that's red hot and he's going to take it out of the furnace and he's going to put it into ice bath water, or just regular water, right? So many hundreds of degrees colder to thermally shock it. He's only going to put part of it in the water. The reason why is the part outside the water is going to stay hot. The part inside the water is going to be cooled. So it's shrinking, but the other part isn't. So you'll see that this will definitely break because this stuff is still expanded. This stuff is shrinking. That means that there's a strain mismatch across that interface and it's just going to fracture. <clears throat> so it's going to fracture and break by the time he takes it out. It's got a nice crack going all the way through it. Whereas if you take a thermal shock resistant ceramic, one where they've designed it to resist that shock, you'll find that it, I should just lift right off, yeah. You'll find that it doesn't have that same problem because they've modified some of these variables that we've talked about, right? What, what did they change? Well, they either changed the thermal expansion, the modulus, the thermal activity, or the strength, or all four of these things to make it less likely to break. All right. Let's do some examples now. In the last bit of class, um, are we doing on time? Oh, good. Okay, let's answer some examples where we do fix first and second law for thermal conductivity <clears throat> and thermal transport. Okay, the first question says the following. It says, you decide to do an Ironman in November, and it has a one-mile swim in Bear Lake. Burr. 
right? It says, if an average male adult swimmer has a body surface area that's given, you know, 1.9 meters squared. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me find this question. Um, and they weigh a certain amount, 170 pounds, and they're going to spend 35 minutes in the 40-degree water, and they have a full-body 3-millimeter neoprene wetsuit, which has a thermal conductivity of 0.054 watts per meter Kelvin, how much heat will his body lose if the heat capacity of the human body is given 3,470 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius? What will be his final body temperature? And then finally, if hypothermia occurs when body goes below 95 degrees Celsius, should he be worried? Right? So lots in this question. Um, lots going on here. Let's start with the, the easy part, and we'll say that the Q per area per time is equal to negative thermal conductivity dt dx, right? Now, the question, the first thing it asks is how much heat will his body lose, right? So it's asking for Q, right? And we know how long he's in the water, 35 minutes. And we know the area of his body, the surface area. So we've got these two things. It tells us the thermal conductivity of the wetsuit. We know how thick the wetsuit is, three millimeters. So all we need to know is the difference in temperature. <clears throat> so we can assume that he is at, uh, uh, what, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is 310 degrees Kelvin. And then the water is at four degrees Fahrenheit, which is 277, right? So let's go ahead and start writing this out we can say that Q, our heat, which is going to be lost, is going to be equal to negative, uh, what's the thermal conductivity? 0 0.054 watts per meter Kelvin. Um, that's going to be multiplied by the difference in temperature. Our difference in temperature is going to be 310 Kelvin minus 277 Kelvin. So right, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry about that. Is equal to 310 Kelvin. Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> and 40 Fahrenheit is equal to 277 Kelvin. Okay? So let's divide that by the thickness of the wetsuit. That's 0 minus 3 millimeters. So let's just turn that into meters. 3 times 10 to the negative 3 meters. Okay? Multiply this by the area of a human body. And that's going to be 1.9 meters squared times time, times 35 hours, which will turn into seconds, right? So when I start punching things in, the first part of this, Q, the heat lost, is 594 watts per meter squared, okay? Um, times 1.9 meters squared, that's per second, excuse me. Then when we account for, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, no, that, that is correct. That is watts per meter squared, right? So this equals, <clears throat> excuse me, that's equal to 1128 watts. But a watt is a joule per second. So 1128 watts, that's equal to 1128 joules per second. So now let's multiply that by time to get rid of the, the seconds and figure out the total amount, not just the rate of heat loss, but the total amount of heat loss. So Q is going to be equal to 1128 joules per second. That's going to be multiplied by 35 minutes times 60 seconds in a minute. So the seconds cancel out, and we lose a whopping grand total of 2,370,000 joules. Right? So that's the total amount of heat that this individual has lost. That's the first part of the question. Right? How much heat will his body lose? Now it says, okay, given the heat capacity, what will be his final body temperature? Right? Okay, well, we can do that. Um, we know that C, our heat capacity, Cp, is equal to dq, the difference in energy, divided by the difference in temperature. Or in other words, we know how much energy he's lost. It's going to be the 2.37, right? Um, first off, well, this is equal to 3,470, what is it, joules per kilogram per degree Celsius, which is the same as per degree Kelvin, since it's difference in temperature. And Celsius and Kelvin are on the same scale. There's different relative amounts. Okay?
Um, so let's go ahead and set this equal to the amount of heat lost, which is 2.37 times 10 to the 6th joules. Let's divide that by the mass of the human being. What did we say he weighed? He weighed 170 pounds, and 170 pounds is 77 kilograms. 77 kilograms times delta T. Solving for delta T, we find that it's equal to 8.8 .8 degrees Celsius, or Kelvin. So when we turn that into degrees Fahrenheit, that's equal to, we've gone down to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, he's below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So technically you'd think, oh shoot, he's going to be hypothermic. <clears throat> but he's not. People swim marathons even in places like Bear Lake in November all the time because they're crazy people, right? So why are they not dead crazy people that are frozen in this lake? Uh, the reason why is, what do you think? So brainstorm it to yourself. What have we not accounted for in our very simplistic calculation here? <laughs> right? What have we missed? I think you'll find that one thing, the biggest thing we missed, well, we made some assumptions. First off, we assumed they had a full body wetsuit, meaning every bit of his surface area was covered. It's not the case. His face is open to the water. So it's going to be losing even more heat because it doesn't have this nice low thermal conductivity layer on it. It just has your skin. So that's, that doesn't make this thing any better. But what we're not accounting for is your caloric heat generation. So Iron Man people... They chow on their granola bars and their crazy food gels, right? And that gives them calories. Your body burns those calories up and produces heat. And the reason we call calories calories, which is a unit of heat in food, is because our bodies convert food to heat all the time. And so what we're not accounting for is the heat being generated by his body. Otherwise, if that was not there, he would be hypothermic. And if you have a problem with generating heat because your body's less efficient, you would get hypothermic even wearing a wetsuit, okay? All right, that's his first question. That's an example of Fourier's law because we did it under steady state conditions, right? We assumed steady state conditions here. Now let's do another one. Um, and you can see more examples of this, right, on YouTube. We've done other ones. What about <clears throat> this one? Okay, it says example uh, of fixed second law with thermal transport. If a diamond was at room temperature and you placed it on a hot plate where its surface was now heated to 100 degrees Celsius at time t equals zero, how long would it take for the diamond to reach 80 degrees Celsius, one millimeter from the surface? Make sense? You got a diamond that's all room temperature, right? Um, presumably. Yeah, at room temperature. Room temperature initially, you're going to set it on a furnace, right, a hot plate, where now the surface is instantly 100 degrees Celsius. How long until one millimeter into the material, it's also now reached 80 degrees Celsius? And we're given the thermal diffusivity. So it wants the answer in milliseconds. So, okay, we can set this up. We are going to say that the temperature at any position, x within the material, is going to be minus the initial temperature all the way through it, divided by the surface temperature minus the initial. That's going to be equal to 1 minus the error function of x over 2 root alpha t. Okay? So what is it asking for again? It's going to ask for time time to be solved. We don't know T, but it does give us X. That's one millimeter into the material. It gives us alpha, the thermal diffusivity. We know the surface temperature, the temperature at that point in the material, and the temperature where it started at. So we can just start plugging things in here. This is pretty straightforward. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and do so. Okay. We could say right here, it's going to be 80 degrees Celsius. By the way, it doesn't matter if you use Celsius or Kelvin here right? This would also work for Fahrenheit, I guess. It would. We're going to do Celsius because we're not barbarians, right? So 80 degrees C minus 25 degrees C, that's room temperature, divided by 100 degrees C minus 25 degrees C, right? So that equals, on the left-hand side of the equation, is 0 0.7333. That's going to be equal to 1 minus the error function of... Uh, 0 0.1 centimeters, I'll show you why I'm doing centimeters in a minute, divided by 2 times our thermal diffusivity, which is given in centimeters squared per second. That's why I chose centimeters, so it would cancel root of 11 centimeters per second times T. Okay, so <clears throat> doing a little bit of algebra. Let's bring error function to this side, subtract this 
from the one, so we just get error function. Error function of, let's just call it z for a minute, is equal to one minus 0 0.7333, which equals, what is that? What have I got here? Um, 0 0.2666. <clears throat> when we solve for z, when error function of z equals 0 0.2666, we can solve for z. We're going to do so using the exact thing that we did last class. I would say, okay, error function of z is 0 0.266. So when we scan down here, we say it's getting closer, like this is pretty close. 0 0.26, oh, sorry, between those two. It's between these two values, okay? 0.2666 is between those. So our value for z is gonna be somewhere between 0.2 and 0.25. So we can go ahead and do the math here. We're gonna say, remember, it's y minus y naught, or let me just remind myself, make sure I'm doing it right. Is it y or x first? <clears throat> Let's see, it is, yeah, y over y naught. Okay, y over y naught divided by x minus x naught is equal to y1 minus y naught over x1 minus x naught. So we know what y naught is this time, y is, we don't know what x is. So let's go ahead and plug in. We've got 0 0.2666 minus the lower value, which is 0 0.2227. 0 0.2227 divided by the x value, which is what we don't know, minus the lower x value, which is 0.2. That is equal to um, y1 is 0 0.2763 minus 0 0.2227 divided by 0 0.05. That's just 0.25 minus 0.2. Solving for x, <clears throat> which is equal to z for us, we find that it's equal to 0 0.2408, 0 0.2408. And again, if you don't remember how to do that, that's just cross multiplication to solve for that. Okay, so now that we know that, we can finalize this question. We know that 0 0.2408 is equal to everything inside the error function, right? And inside the error function, we had 0 0.1 centimeters divided by 2 times the square root of 11 centimeters squared per second times t. And when we solve for t, we find that the time in order for this diamond to heat up to 80 degrees Celsius, one millimeter in the material is only 0 0.00392, or in other words, 3.92 milliseconds. Um, like I said, diamond is the best thermal conductor that we know of. It's crazy good, even though there's no electrons, it's a ceramic but it happens to be just phenomenally good because phonons can travel through that rigid lattice, uh, which is really organized, not disordered, uh, really, really well. If you want to see other examples of uh, fixed second law, we've got one here, and I'll save this one for the TAs if they want to work it on Monday or Wednesday. Okay, enjoy, <clears throat> um, get the homework done, and we will see you at the review on Thursday night.